Thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here. So what do you think about the concept of leaving the nuclear age? I don't think we ever are going to. Uh, and I think it might be dangerous if we got too close to that. Uh, the first part is I just don't, can't imagine all the nuclear powers giving up their nuclear weapons. I mean, short of the science fiction scenario, you know, the flying saucers coming down and saying, okay, the game is over. Uh, or even I think if there were nuclear use, which is not to be excluded, especially on the Indian subcontinent, I don't even think that would lead all the states to think this is just too dangerous. Partly because even if they all wanted to give up nuclear weapons, if others were willing, and I'm not sure that would be the case, you know, the who goes first, how do you make sure that others really have given them up? Those hurdles, I would be amazed if were surmounted. But the more important point, which is, I mean, what I've said so far, a lot of people agree with, but regret. The more important argument I'd make, which I know a lot of people disagree with, but I think more of them haven't really thought about it, is the world of global zero is actually um, very dangerous, maybe more dangerous than the world we have now. I, I know it doesn't seem to make sense because it's a world without nuclear weapons. And well, there are two aspects about that world. One is people who worry about American power should really worry about Global Zero. And may I confirm, by Global Zero, you're not oh. talking about the group, you're talking about the yes, abolition of nuclear yes. weapons. Uh, yes, okay. exactly. I was okay. using the term for a world without okay. nuclear weapons. Because okay. uh, in a world without nuclear weapons, what's Trump's enforce? Co co conventional, a strange word, you know, regular tanks, guns, etc. Well, there are some countries that don't match the U.S. in nuclear weapons, but can do plenty of damage, as we'll mm -hmm. talk about. No one comes close to the U.S. in conventional forces. So if you were a citizen of any country other than the U.S. that would worry about the U.S., and you don't have to be, quote, anti-American to worry about the U.S. I'm American. I worry about the U.S. use of power. I'd really worry in a world without nuclear weapons. We can do anything that force allows. That isn't anything, of course. But that's... You know, doing that, that's a lot. Well, this goes back to your seminal work, The Meaning mm. of the Nuclear Revolution, in which you argue that for deterrence, okay, and I'm guessing that's part of what you're saying yes. now. But also, and related to deterrence, if you got a world in which everyone did give up their nuclear weapons and everyone trusted that everyone else had, you haven't gotten rid of, and you can't get rid of the knowledge in those countries of how to build nuclear weapons. And assuming that international politics still is separate sovereign states, you know, the Martians haven't come down to rule us, the UN hasn't turned into a world government or anything like that, each country, has to, each at least of the old nuclear states, really has to eye the others very suspiciously. Because if I don't have any, and you get one or two, that is, you know, makes me very vulnerable. Now, if we both have a hundred or a thousand and you get two more, eh, right, big deal. But if we're at zero, you get a few, I'm really very insecure, and so I don't have to be offensive to worry. I think, gee, if you get one or two and I don't have any, so maybe I'd better get one or two and put them in the basement just to be sure. So when you think of the arms race potential among countries that are capable of nuclear weapons, which is all the ones that have them now, plus several, that's very unstable. But then by this argument, wouldn't those countries without nuclear weapons then want to develop them? Yes. And, and, and those that makes us safer? <laughs> no, yeah. And not only the countries, how many of them are not eight or nine that have nine. nuclear weapons, yeah. but there are a number of countries very peaceful. Sweden, who could be more peaceful than Sweden? Let's remember the Swedes uh, conquered half of Europe and was it the 17th century? You know, they, that can come back. And any country, especially worrying about American conventional force, even if they don't have them now, 
If everyone else gives them up, hey, if we got them, that would be a very, you yeah, know, that would make us much more secure or enable us to uh, do nasty things to our neighbors. Short of shooting all the nuclear scientists and technicians, or the nice thing in the movie, or Men in Black, the little pen that erases people's memories, uh, I think that a zero level is not only impractical, but it's a place that if we got to, it would be extraordinarily dangerous. Do you think within this scenario that other countries are going to develop nuclear weapons? You know, this has been, it's still very hard. Whoever said, I thought it was Yogi Berra, the American you know, uh, baseball player, but I've told it's Niels Bohr, who said, prediction is difficult, especially about the future. What we know is that ever since the nuclear era started, we've overpredicted the rate of proliferation. Almost every president, almost every analyst looking has said, we're going to get at a much higher pace. Uh, I think more, unlike some people who think more would be better, and we might talk about that. Uh, I, I don't think that, so I would like to keep, uh, keep us where we are, if not roll back some countries. I'm guardedly optimistic that the nuclear deal with Iran, if it holds, I think it probably will, but you know, no way to tell. That, uh, I think, means you won't see other countries in the Middle East going for nuclear weapons. And if North Korea doesn't test a lot more or build a lot more, and I worry because I think they will, then I think Japan is not going to go nuclear. And, you know, we're barring unforeseen circumstances, they always occur. Mm -hmm. It's hard to see uh, who's next in line, what country would have a strong motive from either security, domestic pressures, pride, which are the three main drivers. Uh, I don't see the next, uh, the next ones in line. Mm -hmm. And although, as I said, prediction is difficult, we always knew who the likely candidates were. Mm -hmm. We were wrong that a number of them would get weapons, but we haven't seen cases where sort of out of the blue, oh my God, we never thought X country was going to get nuclear weapons, mm -hmm. and now it has. So I'm guardedly optimistic that we won't see the spread. But I should say that a marvelous political scientist, friend of mine, Kenneth Waltz, the mm -hmm. leading American theorist of international politics, mm -hmm. who was very perverse. He always liked making arguments that disagreed with everyone else. And mm -hmm. he argued proliferation would be good for the world. Why? Because he said nuclear weapons really stabilized Soviet-American relations, and we should talk about mm -hmm. that briefly and what it means mm -hmm. for the future. Mm -hmm. And if we accept that, he said, well, it'll have the same effect in all other pairs. And he argued, some validity, but debatable, that relations between, say, India and Pakistan have been much more stable since they both got nuclear weapons. It's true, there have been no war since they both had weapons. Uh, been some terrorism, some slightly scary things, but those scary things didn't lead to war, whereas they might have before. And Ken even argued in an infamous article in Foreign Affairs that if Iran got nuclear weapons, it might make the Middle East more stable, again, by perpetuating mutual deterrence. I think that argument has a number of things that are wrong with it. Mm -hmm. It's an argument of a type academics like because you know it's wrong, but you really got to work to show that it's wrong. And then when you show this wrong, you realize, well, maybe I'm wrong. Maybe he really is right. I don't think so. But it's a good academic argument. But the whole, uh, idea, but of mu it. The whole idea of mutually assured destruction yeah. as somehow creating peace yeah. just seems so oxymor oxymoronic. It does. And I've argued in two of my books that, that that really is right. I don't think for a minute I can prove it. But the, the counterintuitive logic isn't so crazy. It's that in the old days with all conventional weapons, even if they were quite destructive, 
someone could win a war. I mean, the you know, U.S., Britain, and France won World War I by almost any definition. Say it was a mistake to fight it. You know, there are lots of things to argue about. But in the end, it's hard to dispute that we won. And again, the Allies, including the Soviet Union, won World War II. Uh, if both sides not only have nuclear weapons but have what we call mutual second strike capability, mm -hmm. which simply means the weapons are numerous and most important, secure enough so that they can't be destroyed in an enemy first strike. What that means is quite clearly, if there's a nuclear war, both sides lose. Each side can the destroy whole world each loses. other. Yes. No. <laughs> yes. And in, in some scenarios, actually, mm -hmm. the whole world through a, what they call nuclear winter could mm -hmm. suffer. I mean, it could really wipe out mankind, Clearly. perhaps. But even if that isn't right, at least the two countries that fight mm -hmm. both lose and they know they're going to lose mm -hmm. because this is so clear. And you've never, you know, and that is new with nuclear weapons. And mm -hmm. that's why I didn't coin the phrase. I I've shamelessly took it from others who got there before me. Say it's a revolution because in international politics, especially in great powers, the engine of international politics is the possibility of winning wars. And even when states weren't fighting it, they were like teenage boys to be sexist and mm -hmm. sex, right? They may not be doing it all the time. You know, they're thinking about it all the yeah. time. Mm -hmm. So c great powers were always thinking about the possibility of war, mm -hmm. often planning for it, often trying to avoid it. But it was central to everything in their relations. Mm -hmm. But once you say, we can't win a war, mm -hmm. they can't win it, mm -hmm. they know it, we know they win it, they, they know it, mm -hmm. it makes the world arguably much more stable, at least in terms of actually using the weapons. But it's weird because we really have a paradox. These weapons are very important for international politics because they can't be used. But how can something be really important when everyone knows it can't be used? Khrushchev, you know, Nikita Khrushchev, he became uh, first secretary of Soviet. Union, 54, got power. He said at first, he said he could not sleep at night because he was in charge of nuclear weapons. Mm -hmm. And then he realized they'd never be used. And he said, and then I slept soundly <laughs> from then on. But to play devil's advocate, yeah. for example, yeah. I mean, you know, human error. Yes. And there have been, yes. you know, the possibility of an accident. Yes. Yes. The testing is so yes. deleterious to health. Yes. You know, so it isn't as if yes. they are benign by any means. Well, there, there are several parts. I agree. And there are several parts. One, nuclear testing above ground. It was a big debate at the time. How dangerous? No one thought they were healthy. Not even any presidential candidates ever said that. Mm -hmm. But uh, there was debate on how unhealthy, but certainly it was not good. And of course, then we agreed testing underground and even the new nuclear powers generally tested underground. Then there are accidents of two types. One is, if you will, a pure accident. Someone, if you will, smoking around a bomb. <laughs> and there are some pretty horrendous stories in a recent <laughs> book that well, mostly the public, but he had a number that we didn't know mm -hmm. quite as much about. Near misses? Or, yes. yes. By mm -hmm. physical accidents, mm -hmm. you know, fires in planes carrying mm -hmm. bombs. There's a lot of effort to try to make them very safe. Mm -hmm. But So how yes. can we say we're safer and more secure with this? Well, there's still a chance, and you're absolutely right, because even on the pure accidents, you can't fully test the things. And if you make them 100% safe, you can never fire them. And there was one case, our first generation Polaris warheads, these are the submarine launch warheads. Mm -hmm. The safety measure was great. Turned out five years later, we learned the, mess, the warhead would never go off because the safety measure, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> wouldn't, was so good it was not going to allow the missile ever to be filed or the warhead ever to go off. So not you've got that and then you've got several different kinds of human accidents exactly like take india and pakistan you know which i think clinton called it the most dangerous place on earth 
Neither Indians nor Pakistanis like that. That's one thing they agreed on. But Clinton was right. Uh, that is still the area where nuclear war is most likely. And one of the scenarios is unauthorized use in, in the Pakistani army, especially coming out of domestic unrest. Mm -hmm. Another is a coup by Islamic militants. Uh, Pakistanis tell us not to worry. They've got it all taken care of. Worry. You know, I mean, it could also be argued that the, just the culture of secrecy around nuclear yeah. weapons also does not give comfort. Yeah. Well, there's a real paradox in that. I, I think you're right that on the mm -hmm. one hand, you need secrecy to decrease the chance of accidents, decrease them. Right. But on the other hand, the very secrecy means that outsiders with real expertise can't look at the, the plans and say, mm -hmm. you know, I've looked at this for six months and I've found a back door. Mm -hmm. And if you don't do that, you know, when you're in charge, there may be a back door. Mm -hmm. And there are all sorts of crazy possibilities. More, one thing, again, with the, especially the U.S. and Soviet and Russia, mm -hmm. or India and Pakistan even more, mm -hmm. if you think you're ab about to be attacked or under attack, mm -hmm. you're more likely to launch preemptively. To, mm -hmm. Well, the weapons are pretty secure, but the warning systems mm -hmm depend on electronics, and there are lots of problems. I, my former colleague and friend, Spignu Brzezinski, tells the story that he was woken up one night when he was a Jimmy Car President Carter's security advisor mm -hmm. and told there were 22 nuclear warheads on the way. He had five minutes to decide. To so he gets, mm -hmm. he's very worried. Guy comes in two minutes later and says, uh, Mr. Brzezinski, they're now 222. And he's more worried, but he thinks, wait a minute. Mm. Guy comes in next, and again, another mm -hmm. minute who says, they're 2,222, and Spig stops worrying mm -hmm. because he figures out, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Twos, something's got to be wrong. Right. And the next time they come in with 22,000 when the Soviets don't have that, yeah. Computer glitch, instead of printing out zeros, mm -hmm. it was printing out twos. Mm -hmm. That's disturbing enough, but also when we think that many of these weapon systems actually are computer based, which means that they're vulnerable to hacking. You know, that's and that's a good question. No, I don't know. No, uh, no, I've read studies that say that that is also another thing. There'd yes. be two things, and, and I don't have the expertise for this. Yes. One would be could you hack in fire a weapon? Mm -hmm. The other is, could you hack in and and spoof the warning systems? Yes, yes. And I, the, and I just don't know. I'm sure the U.S. government and the Russian worry government, but the Pakistani government, I mean, which doesn't, not to deride them, but you know, they have put a lot of resources, but they don't have the resources that we have, mm -hmm. uh, and there the warning time is much shorter. And yeah. so that would be another security risk, potentially. Now, I would like to actually go back to the whole yeah. point of your talking about deterrence, but also, what about the fact that many of these weapons are on this hair trigger alert? Yeah. Would you be willing to take some yes. off that? Yes, <laughs> yes. I, I think there's no reason mm -hmm. to have them on alert. Okay. We have done some de-alerting. Uh, Bruce Blair, who is well, not the expert one of the two or three real ones who served as a Minuteman launch officer in the Cold War mm -hmm. and turned up a number of fascinating, disturbing things about command and control systems. And he's worked on the de-alerting for years and Unlike some people who make proposals for arms and disarmament, he, he really knows what he's talking about. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there, there are various kinds of de-alerting, mm -hmm. and there are a lot of details, but basically there are things you can do to reduce the chance of accident. The main, and, and things that do that introduce more time between the time you say, oh boy, I'm really, really worried, in time you could fire something, mm -hmm. a missile. The only argument against that is, oh, what if an enemy can sort of get inside your mm -hmm. time, you know, and So it limits your second ready. strike potential. Yeah, and I think that's 
given our intelligence and given the state of world politics, at this point, I regard that as implausible. Mm -hmm. De alerting is reversible. So mm -hmm. if suddenly Russia seemed even more reckless and bellicose than it is now, you could reverse it. Uh, there may be arguments against de alerting, but I've never heard, I've never heard them. Really so if you were asked to give your personal yeah. opinion, which you often are, would yeah. you would you say that would you like to see just de-alerting across the board? Yes. You know, I'd like to <clears throat> propose that and hear if someone can rebut it. Okay. <laughs> and the other thing I think de-alerting does, because it, it's a step to putting nuclear weapons in the background even further. Mm -hmm. I mean, because if, you know, I say, look, global zero would isn't going to happen bad if it did. But there is the potential that we've talked about and potential especially, say, in the subcontinent, but elsewhere for nuclear war. There's, even if I'm right that now there are no people lining up to get it, that can change. So one thing that would be very helpful would be if we no longer had to have programs like this. That I mean, if, if those of us who worked on nuclear weapons were sort of out of business, the people didn't think about them. Mm -hmm. Oh, you know they're there, you, but you don't dwell on them. Uh, they're not. But they still get funding. What? But they still get a lot of funding. Well, <laughs> yes. Now, the question of the modernization, which is the funds, mm -hmm. there are two parts, and they're both difficult. One is the safety. One reason we've had in the last 10 years a number of things that shouldn't happen, like flying miss, you know, the bombers across the country with nuclear weapons, and no one knew there were nuclear, including yeah. the crew, yeah. knew there were nuclear weapons on there. Yeah. Part of the reason for that is in the Cold War, people handling nuclear weapons, that was the high prestige in the Air Force. That mm -hmm. was the big ticket. Once they're unimportant, it's not the fast track in the military. Who do you put in? Ah, oh, the Schlemiel who we know can't do anything. We don't want him doing something important like being prepared to fight, so have him or her watching the nuclear weapons. So you need enough so the organization takes it really seriously. And then there are safety-related issues and others about the degree of modernization. So we probably have to spend something. A trillion? <laughs> I, I'm skeptical. It's big business, you know. But so. you have to, what, to really judge that, mm -hmm. it's very hard because it takes enormous expertise. And what we've got to do is have people with expertise but different opinions and different interests mm -hmm. argue it and people like you and me and more important Congress, the President and the counterparts in other countries listen in mm -hmm. on that conversation mm -hmm. and make the judgment. Well let's say if you were to give, so you say zero does not make yeah, sense, yeah. okay. What number would make sense to you? Yeah, well here we have the problem of there are countries other than the U.S. and Mm -hmm. Russia with nuclear weapons. And we're talking the question of China and uh, North Korea, both of which are increasing their arsenals. Mm -hmm. If we in Russia drop too much without capping their programs, mm -hmm. They'll have an in, they may have an incentive to increase. We don't want that. And the U.S. and Russia has what 95 percent of the weapons, or something like that. A, a, a rather, know, a, a rather large percentage. A large so percentage. we could say. But it's probably not in the 90s anymore. Pa okay. Pakistan's really ramping up. Uh, China is now increasing. Well, it might be in the 90s still now, but and partly it's a question of whether we're counting those in stockpiles that are stored mm -hmm. but not on in workable bombs or not. Mm -hmm. That's a big deal. We have a lot of them that really are de-alerted, but fully, I mean, that is out there somewhere. But Because we don't know because of secrecy. <laughs> but yeah, yeah. I think that the numbers yeah. are open, but, okay. uh, if, but if we cut our active stockpile mm -hmm. too much, you run into that problem. But you know, a smaller number will will certainly do it, but it's less the number than I think the salience in there. I mean, I, I don't think people would feel safer if we had, say, 
300 than 1,000. It's what you get used to. And there is something to be said for the decrease, even if you're not going to get to zero, because first, that lives up to part of our commitment in the Non-Proliferation Treaty, where the nuclear exactly. powers we're going to... And some people think that really influences non-nuclear powers. I don't, but it's sort of a legitimate debate. But it, again, could be part of saying, look, you know, these are things that may exist, but they're not important. And partly saying taking the numbers down shows they're not important. What about the push now for the humanitarian impact, you know, initiative and looking at that and all of these non-nuclear states joining and saying from a humanitarian uh, perspective, they just are unacceptable. What would you, how would you argue well, with that? Well, I mean, it's, it's certainly true. A nuclear war would be the greatest humanitarian disaster. We thank you so much for having joined us, no. Dr. Robert Jervis, and for having shared your insight with us. And we thank you also for joining us as well.